Hey everybody, Hawker Studios here. Um, I'm going to walk you through another painting that I've just finished. Uh, here's the reference. It's uh, kind of a Photoshop uh, job that corn and the, the pheasant were photographed separately and I kind of just stuck them together. Um, so here I am starting on a canvas panel. It's a 16 by 20. Um, I've toned the canvas with a mixture of titanium white and raw umber and just put a couple quick guides down for placement, uh, just basically the horizon of the snow and then a, a few lines just to um, kind of corral the, the exact position of the pheasant itself. And so here I'm just drawing a, a rough line drawing um, with some alizarin crimson and maybe some transparent oxide red, just a warm red, doesn't really matter what it is. Red um, blends in uh, well with the overpainting, so that's why you know, I, a lot of artists use red as a drawing color. If you were to use blue or green or something, that tends to clash with uh, a lot of the things that you would put over top of it, so red is a good choice for that. Um, what attracted me to this particular subject, um, I just liked the, I liked the abstract quality of the corn. It's kind of a horizontal theme. You have kind of bands, bands of the sky, then the corn and the snow beneath. So I like that simple composition, just horizontal bands more or less, um, with the texture of the corn in the middle. I wanted then also just to stick the pheasant in there to interrupt that horizontal banding as just kind of a, a way for the subject to stand off. It's kind of the one thing in the piece that isn't part of that theme, that horizontal theme. So. And that's the kind of the thought process behind what attracted me to this particular subject. And then I also like the lighting. It was kind of a subdued, cloudy day, as you can see, um, with a little bit of light off in the distance in the sky, which I like the subtlety of that. There's kind of a subtle warmth um, to both the, the sky and the snow and the corn. It may sound strange to say that there's warmth in the snow, but it's not like a cool not a blue snow. On a sunny day you get dark intense blue shadows but on an overcast day a lot of times you'll get a gray or even a warm snow so I like that warmth. So here I'm trying to establish that color harmony actually and, and uh, at first uh, the color I use for the snow as you can maybe see is, is just a lot cooler than I wanted it to be. Again with those overcast days you, there's not a lot of color in the snow so you'll see me here trying to dial back that cool tone. I added some black and then to lighten it back up again I added some white but I'm trying to get much more of a balanced um, gray tone in the snow not not quite so cool. So I'm going to the sky and again just trying to rough in around um, the outline of the objects and I'm deliberately painting uh, kind of quickly and roughly not inaccurately, but I like the dry brush, you know, the, the broken stroke. You can kind of see the canvas coming through underneath. I'm purposely doing that. I, I could thin the paint and make it much more soupy and really um, put it down so that it rendered very smoothly and covered every aspect of the canvas beneath it, but I'm, I'm not interested in that. I'll talk a little bit about technique in a second here, but just notice the the brokenness of the strokes, the dryness. Um, that's a conscious decision on my part. I like that look, and so I'm, I'm deliberately painting like that on this one. And I find myself painting more and more like that um, as I paint longer. And that's because of influences. You know, specific artists that I admire I employ that, and we'll look that, at that here in just um, a little bit. <clears throat> But just notice that technique. Uh, it's a conscious thing. So let's talk a little bit about technique. Um, for me, uh, you can definitely render something photographically real and tight. And uh, given enough time I, and, and not driving myself crazy, I could probably paint that painting this way. But here are a couple paintings by an artist named Nikolai Fetchin. He was a Russian, Russian painter, somewhat contemporary. I think he died in the 70s. I love his work, and this one of my main influences. 
Um, but again, notice the simplicity and the brokenness of his strokes. Everything he did was absolutely correct. He was a phenomenal draftsman. But he didn't fuss. You know, the wrinkles in that shirt are just a thin black stroke on top of everything else. And that's all they need to be. There's no reason to over-render that shirt in my mind. You know, different artists can, can differ on how they choose to paint. Um, but I show those pieces just to illustrate my thought process and sort of the feel that I'm attempting to get with this piece. And again, if the subject uh, lends itself to it, I try to paint like that more and more lately. Certain subject matter, it's difficult to get that broken feel. For instance, actually the pheasant in this piece, when I get to it, um, is not, to my mind, you're not able to really get that uh, rougher, broken technique because the pheasant itself is so finely detailed. Um, you can't oversimplify some things. You know, simplification is a wonderful thing, and the corn lends itself to that and that rough technique. But a pheasant, there's so much fussy detail in a pheasant, you can't simplify it beyond a certain point. It's like trying to simplify a zebra. You can't just paint your zebras gray. You have to have the stripes. If you're painting a zebra, and that can tend to be somewhat fussy, but it's a necessity. So certain subject matter lends itself more easily to this type of a technique, but I, I showed you that, like I said, just to show you kind of what I'm going for. So I just mapped in a rough, warm uh, shadow tone. I'm just a lot of times I like to fill the canvas with something. It doesn't have to be completely accurate for me to start with, and we talked about that in the last video that I did. I'm not looking to nail the colors precisely at first, and the certain artists are more comfortable doing that, and that's uh, certainly a valid way to paint, but I just like to cover the canvas with something close, and it gives me something to judge against. Um, to me, a white canvas is so distracting and it's trying, it's like, to make, to make informed, delicate um, painting decisions when you have huge parts of your canvas that are glaringly white is difficult for me to do. It's kind of like trying to have a whisper conversation in a room where people are shouting. I, it's difficult for me to paint that way because um, the white is so distracting and so a lot of times to start, I just want to get the canvas covered in a general way with things that are in the ballpark, drawn correctly, just so then I can start to really think and make decisions that um, will last and hold up in the painting. So that's what I'm doing here. I, I just put a warm shadow tone down for the corn um, and the same for the pheasant. I'm just trying to get the rough values and colors in the right place, drawn correctly. <coughs> and then I can go back and start really thinking. So now I have, um, I'm noticing the darkest darks. This corn was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, this is my favorite part of the painting. There are certain shapes in the corn that I am looking to more or less, I don't know if you want to say copy, but really replicate closely. Other parts of the corn, I'd say it's maybe half and half. Half of the shapes in the corn I really want to nail. Half of the other shapes, it's not really important. What I'm looking for is just the kind of the key, kind of the key things in the corn and make it read as corn. And there are certain shapes that I really like and want to really capture. And others, it won't really matter. I mean, a lot of the background shapes, it doesn't, I'm not trying to replicate those um, particularly, and I'm not concentrating. I just kind of fill it in with a value and a color. So, <clears throat> It was a lot of fun just trying to get this corn to read as corn, but in a very general, rough, again, that kind of that Russian painting style way. <coughs> Excuse me. I've changed the camera angle up to a higher angle now, so um, hopefully I don't block the work as I paint from the camera. Um, so here again, I'm looking for the darkest darks. I'm um, trying to find kind of the some shape in the corn. Um, and I'm concentrating on not being redundant with what I do. I'm looking for unique, interesting shapes that don't repeat themselves. 
<coughs> excuse me, our tendency as painters and as people in general is to um, be redundant in our strokes. It's difficult not to be, but when you study nature, nature is random. The redundancy isn't there, and so it, a lot of times it takes a conscious effort not to be redundant when you're painting like this, especially when you're dealing with an abstract subject like this. Um, so I'm putting in the darkest darks, and then well, here's some warmer tones. Um, I'm just kind of trying to see the corn as having layers and trying to see what the under layers are. I can come back with lighter tones and develop the form over top of these dark tones. <clears throat> and that's the traditional way of oil painting um, to work that way. And so, um, again, trying to see through the corn, see it as um, layers and develop those layers. So here I'm coming in with some of the lighter tones, kind of that golden um, corn color. <clears throat> and this corn is just kind of a slow buildup process. Um, I'm trying to think about those shapes that I'm seeing. Some of them, again, I'm trying to duplicate directly. Others, I'm not so worried about. I'm just looking to suggest the corn. <clears throat> There would have been a time when I would have attempted to have painted these very literally, these corn stalks. And I would have analyzed every shape in there and um, possibly even drawn it out on the canvas beforehand and would have rendered it very photorealistically or tried to. And there are a lot of painters, especially wildlife artists, that definitely still paint like that. <clears throat> Detail is king, in their mind at least. And I don't have anything against those paintings or those people. Some of them are, are well done, and I have a lot of respect for them. A lot of what you paint, when you've paint, been painting for a while, is a reflection of you. And I guess what I'm revealing about myself as I paint more is that I don't have the patience to render photorealistically like that. And I ask myself, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that I don't really know for me, and again, I'm not trying to establish anybody else's painting style, but for me, I don't understand what the purpose of that would be. If you're interested in photorealism, that's what photographs are for. This is a painting, and I'm not apologizing for the fact that this is a painting. In fact, I'm celebrating it. This is meant to be absolutely correct as far as its value, its shape, its drawing, the fact that this is corn with pheasant, I'm not trying to hide that, but I don't need to vendor it photorealistically. If that's what I was interested in, I would have framed the, the photograph and hang that on the wall. No, this is a painting. This is an interpretation. This is a celebration of the subject matter, but also a celebration of paint on canvas. And so at times, um, I like the idea of even being brazen about the fact that this is just paint, leaving that stroke extremely rough. And I'm not even nearly as rough as Fetchin was. <clears throat> I'd like to be someday. <clears throat> it takes a lot of guts to paint like that and a lot of, um, well, courage to leave a stroke in its really simplistic form. Uh, but when, when a painting is accomplished in that simple, rough matter, manner, but yet everything is correct and reads exactly as it should, to me that's magic. It's just absolutely magical when you walk up and look closely and it's just big rough smears of paint on canvas and it looks chaotic but then you step away from 10 feet and it's just absolutely all there that to me is what painting is about <clears throat> that's the magic that's the paradox of something that can be so correct and beautiful from a viewing distance and yet up close it's absolutely rough and um <clears throat> So that's what I'm trying to celebrate. I've, I've reached an age. Um, I'm 41 years old. 
And I've told myself that uh, I've been doing this for a long time now. There is absolutely no reason for me to paint any other way than the way I want to paint. And that may sound like a, a stupid realization to come to at this stage in life, but <clears throat> it's very easy to get trapped into trying to paint for the market, trying to paint a painting that you think will sell, that the majority of people will appreciate, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all those things can influence you every time you pick up a paintbrush. Um, but I've just come to the realization that life is too short. I'm going to paint the way I want to paint. And if it means I never sell a painting again, um, so be it. That uh, may be uh, easier said than done. But, but the irony is, when you truly paint like that, and I'm not saying that every, every time I pick up the brush I'm that pure in my, my motives or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> but when an artist <clears throat> paints what he truly loves and enjoys to that degree, and inevitably, it inevitably comes out in his work. The paintings are more uh, vibrant and rich, and as I said, every time you pick up the, the paintbrush, you're really kind of painting a portrait of yourself in, to some extent or another. And so when you're true to what you truly value <clears throat> and appreciate, um, it comes across in the work. The work has a, a life that it wouldn't otherwise if you were just painting because you think it might sell or for some other motivation. And so I have to continue to remind myself of that. You know, why am I painting this? Or um, my goal in painting something like this is to have something that I would want to hang on my wall. I'm not painting this for anybody else. This is something that um, I want to enjoy. And so it's not that I won't sell it. I'm planning on trying to sell it. But the motivation when you pick up something like this is to um, really be true to what you appreciate. And that sounds kind of arrogant and uh, egocentric, but it's the way to truly um, pulling off a successful painting, frankly. And these are all things that, you know, maybe you can say I should have learned this a long time ago. And, you know, of course, most true artists believe that and, you know, don't have any qualms about painting what truly moves them. But it's when you're thinking commercially and you're, you're trying to pay some bills or support a family and, you know, all these things enter into the equation, sometimes it's tough to maintain that purity of motive. And so uh, I've had to reinforce that a few times in my career. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's all about growth. <clears throat> so I'm still just going in with some lighter tones, some warmer tones, some colors that I see in that corner when I look at the reference. Um, a lot of times with, you know, for instance, this particular part that I'm painting now, or a lot of stages in a, any painting, it's, it's kind of a, I think of it as a push-pull thing. You, you put the darks down, then you put lights over top, and then you go back in with the darks, and you, you really try to establish that form, but it's, it's a back and forth. It's a push and a pull between the lights and the darks. And you push it too far in one direction, and then you bring it back with the lights, and then you push it. You maybe did too many lights, and so you have to go back in and push it back with the darks. And so it's, it's a, kind of a tennis match, back and forth, to try to find that form to try to be true to your subject, but in an interesting way. And so, uh, now I'm back to darks again. You see I'm going back in and trying to separate out again some of those forms that maybe have gotten a little muddled with the application of the lights. And you can see it's starting to, you know, come together. It starts to look like corn. It's not perfect in the the artistic choice along the way is to how far to take it. You know, like I said, you could, I could, given enough time and patience, I could just render this thing until it's as detailed as it could ever be. You know, do I want to take it there? Well, in this case, no. I I, I want to state it simply. I want everything to be correct. And I want it to read, but I'm not interested in that detail. So, again, you know, how far do you take it? Where do you stop? Where do you say? 
that's all I want to say with this corn. It reads as corn, and I'm done. That's the question. That's the, the paradox or the some of the challenges that you face as painting. That's it's not earth shattering stuff. It's just you if you want to have an effective painting, you have to ask yourself these things. So here I'm going back in with even some grays. There were some cool tones, especially in the leaves of the corn in the background. And um, so I'm brightening some things up. I'm trying to notice some of the, the frayed leaves of the sheaves of corn or some, some of the curly leaves of the corn and, and get that in. But a lot of it's just kind of suggesting it with simple brushwork. <clears throat> so then here's some more almost orange tones, really warm. You know, because some of that in the reference as well. The variety is what really is striking when you when you stop and study something to the extent that you paint it and you really try to analyze what colors are in just a um, an abstract swatch of corn like this. There's grays and browns and blacks and oranges and, you know, it's just innumerable. You think of corn as being yellow. Well, that's just the most simplistic way of thinking about it. There's so much in there. And that's the fun and the challenge of trying to paint something like this, getting all those shapes um, correct, <clears throat> but then also trying to be true to the form. And then you have to ask yourself, you know, am I interested in you know, actually pushing that color a little bit. You know, if I see a warm orange in there, do I really kind of jack up that orange a little bit and make it go a little farther to make it a little more noticeable and a little more pronounced? You know, would that be an effective decision to try to do? You know, these are all the questions that you ask yourself as you're painting is, am I trying to subdue something, downplay it, or do I see some unique color in there that I really want to show people, hey, can you believe that this color is in this corn? And you really kind of want to jack it up. You know, it's all personal decision as you paint. I mean, Fetchin had a lot of abstract color uh, in his work. You know, if you look at uh, just skin tones, a lot of his pieces, there's greens and purples and oranges. And it's just every color of the spectrum in there. And to me, that there's so much life in a painting like that. You could just look at it and study it and enjoy all that's going on in there. It's not, you paint somebody's face, you know, you think of a skin tone, but it's not just some flat color. And you could paint it that way, but the painting would look dead. It would just be boring. Why not have fun with it and put all these colors in there in, in a fun way, in a unique way, and that, you know, you could still again, stand back, and it absolutely is true. It absolutely reads. To me, that's such a higher a higher way of painting. And it's not easy. I think more people would do it if they could, but that's what I'm striving for. I'm not saying I'm successful at it. But So here in the sky, um, I stepped back, and the color to me in the sky was a little too cutesy. It was a little too blue. I didn't want to paint a bluebird sky. It was more of a gray. There was cool tones in there. And I apologize, the video color is not entirely accurate. So all I was doing there is just kind of toning down the saturation of the sky, making it more gray as opposed to blue. <coughs> Can't really see too much of a difference on the video, and it wasn't much of a difference. It's just something I wanted to do. Um, so now I'm mixing a little bit of the lighter tone in the sky. I'm going back in. I want that band of yellow to to be pretty pronounced. Again, it wasn't like a like a total sunrise type scenario. This was probably taken at mm, nine thirty in the morning, but there was a little bit of warmth to the sky, a little bit of yellow, and um, I just want that to be obvious. But you always have to kind of evaluate and measure, okay, so there's a yellow in the sky. How does that compare to the yellow of the corn? Is it more intense than the corn, or is it just lighter in value? I mean, is, another, is, it, is it more saturated, or is it just lighter? And you have to kind of compare back and forth 
for it to read correctly. <coughs> and I'm painting these passages thick. And I'm not worried if, you know, the sky kind of goes up to a corn stalk but doesn't quite completely connect with it. Again, those little broken areas, those little areas that make it completely obvious that it's painting, I enjoy that. that to me, that's cool. You can take it too far. You can be careless. Um, but again, I'm not trying to apologize for the fact that this is a painting and not a photograph. So now I'm taking some really light tones, some light yellow or light gray, and going back in and, and putting what you may call highlights on the leaves, even though on a cloudy day there aren't, you know, classical highlights like we think of, as if the sun was shining bright. <clears throat> I'm just putting the brighter tones in, and then here's some warms again. Again, a lot of doing something like this, and it's maybe a little boring to watch, which is the reason why I've sped this up five times speed, so that the painting can kind of develop a little quicker to the viewer here. It's just a, a little bit of a grind, and you just have to keep, keep a fresh eye if you can, and go back in and try to find those interesting colors and be true to those shapes. Like here, and there's a little, that little branch, I don't know if it's a weed or something, I like the shape of that, so I'm putting that in, but notice I'm not, I like that stroke just there, that one straight stem on the right side. Notice it's not just one color all the way down. It's broken. The value is, is different um, at different points along the way. I could easily just load the brush up with paint and do one quick stroke and make that stem all one color, but that'd be so boring and flat. And unnatural. That's not the way nature is. You know, if you look at trees or any kind of grasses, there's infinite variation along one piece of grass stem. You know, and so you kind of get that mindset as a painter, and you don't want to put just one big boring stroke. You break it up a little bit, and you show some variety, and it reads so much better. And and somebody could come along and compare the reference to the painting and say, well, that stem didn't actually look like that. Who cares? <laughs> you know, who cares? If it looks interesting, there's your justification. That's all you need. And most time, of course, you know, people will never see the reference along with the painting. And so those comparisons will never be made. But that's how you have to think as an artist it's like, nobody's going to see the reference next to this. So here I'm starting to work on the pheasant, but notice the close-up of the, the corn in the background, even at this stage. You have yellows and browns and greens and oranges and grays. And um, I'm not saying that this is like some masterpiece, but I like, I like that variety and the chatter that the variety makes. Um, that's what I was going for. That's what I wanted to do with this piece, so... It was fun when it's it sort of works, and again, I'm not saying this is the pinnacle of you know all art anywhere, but um, I like the way it's shaping up so far here. And as I said, you know, thinking about the technique, thinking about painting roughly, I wasn't sure at this stage how I was going to handle the pheasant in that way, <clears throat> and whether I was successful in handling it that way in the end. I don't know. I mean, that's maybe up for debate. But I'm trying to just treat the pheasant in a simple way, seeing the simple forms, his simple shape. And I put some kind of uh, radio lines around his uh, chest there just to kind of understand the shape visually. Because a lot of his feathers kind of have a pattern doing that. <clears throat> but I was a little unsure about how to, how to go about this bird who is so intricate and detailed but then try to match kind of that free, fresh stroke style, the background. How do you juxtapose that? You don't want it to look like the background and the bird were painted by two different painters. They have to kind of fit together. So I didn't want to be all 
um, tight and detailed necessarily on a pheasant, but you kind of have to be in some areas. So this was a challenge too. And honestly, I enjoyed painting the corn a lot more than I enjoyed painting the pheasant. <clears throat> Even though the subject is the pheasant. The corn was fun. <laughs> the corn was an adventure there where there was no real boundaries. I was trying to get certain shapes, but in a lot of ways I could just do whatever I wanted. Not so with the pheasant. Got to be a lot more true. <clears throat> but the other thing is that I figured out a long time ago, or tell myself, just to not overthink things. You know, if you're up against a challenge and you're not sure how you're going to handle something, that's fine. Just go ahead and paint it. Either it'll work or it won't. You can tend to overthink something and talk yourself out of trying something and, you know, kind of over-philosophize about things, which may be my tendency. <clears throat> Just paint it. You know, problems will work themselves out, or they won't, and it won't work. And then you have to decide whether you're going to just scrap it or change it. Um, but the best f policy for me usually is just to forge ahead and see what happens. So even though I was telling myself here, man, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how I'm going to paint this pheasant in a loose, free way. The only way to find out is to give it a whirl. So that's what I was doing. <coughs> And I think that's okay not to have all the answers to start with. I don't think you ever will. So here, this is pretty tight. And I think it's probably important for the face to maybe be a little more tight. Pheasant's the subject. And the head is and the eye is the focus of the subject, you know, so that f head and face is probably where people are going to naturally look first in this painting, and that's good, that's what I want. You know, so taking a little time there is a good thing. And again, I'm not saying that detail in a painting is bad. Not at all. <coughs> Again, to reference the masters, Fetchin painted some of his faces extremely smooth and extremely correct, and you can tell he took, you know, a great amount of time to render certain areas. The key is to know when that's necessary and when it isn't, because if you're doing it when it's not necessary, I would argue that that's not as effective a work as if you're able to correctly evaluate what's necessary and what isn't. If you're painting extemporaneous details in a, a really uh, meticulous manner, I, I just have to ask myself why, you know? If that's not your subject, that's not where you want people looking necessarily, then why are you paying so much attention to it? So because the pheasant is the subject, I guess it does work that it's a little more finely rendered. But again, I don't want it to look like it's inconsistent with the background. It's got to have that little bit of a rougher painterly feel to it. Otherwise, it'll look out of place in this particular work. I don't want that. So a lot of the rendering of the, the iridescence in the feathers was kind of fun. That green color, there's a lot of blues and purples in that green color in his, in his head. So that was fun to try to find. They're really I don't know if I want to say ridiculous, but they're kind of a ridiculous bird. I mean, they kind of are just over the top as far as all the colors, all the iridescence, the patterns, this big, long, ridiculous tail, red and green and oranges. I mean, every color of the rainbow is in that bird. <clears throat> and so it would be hard to come up with something out of your imagination that was more wild looking when you really think about it. A rooster pheasant is... is a crazy looking bird. But God has an eye for beauty. And uh, sure knows what he's doing when he created these things as far as 
giving you something to look at because, man, there's a lot to look at. So I'm just trying to find some of those patterns. This is probably the most difficult part of this bird because here you have these finely rendered patterns that are on there indisputably. I mean, that's what a pheasant looks like. It's kind of like the stripes on a zebra. And so you kind of have to get a little fussy with it, which is not something I enjoy doing. And again, I don't want it to be inconsistent with the rest of the work. But I don't know how to avoid it. You know, maybe a more experienced painter <clears throat> would handle it different, but I'm not an inexperienced painter, so I guess I just have to make a decision and trust that it's right. But yeah, I don't think you can handle a lot of these feather patterns the way that you handled the corn. I guess that's okay. I just, again, I just didn't want there to be some huge discrepancy between the handling of the bird and the corn. So these are the internal debates in my mind. And I fussed around with it quite a bit in the end. Um, to be honest, this is the sort of thing that I don't enjoy, trying to find those intricate feather patterns. It can look really cool, and I respect artists who do details like that well. And if I slow down, I can do it well, too. To me, it's just so much more fun to get funky with the corn like that. That's That, to me, is painting, whereas this is, like, work. And I'm not thrilled with how this looks right now. I mean, I <clears throat> definitely fussed with it quite a bit more and gone went back and did that whole push-pull thing, went over top again with the some of the lighter, warmer tones and then back in with some of the, the black pattern color. You know, just a, a lot of different runs at it. You know, so even there in some of those feathers, uh, you're seeing kind of a broken dry brush technique. I'm trying to stay consistent. Here I, um, I thought the sky was not dark enough. I wanted more of a uh, kind of a brooding look. So again, I'm not making a huge value change here. It's not, maybe it's kind of subtle. I just thought it would read a lot more if the sky was more of a steel gray. <coughs> it was looking a little washed out to me, so I came back and painted in. Again, not a huge change. To me, it made a big difference as far as just the overall feel of the, of the painting. So now I'm back on the bird. It's very easy to see intense, punchy colors. And a lot of the bird is, you know, there's oranges and purples and dark, rich, russet browns, greens and reds. But then there's also a lot of subtle colors. There's blue grays and that gray on the base of his tail kind of fades into green, a real light, pastel green color on a pheasant. You know, so try to find those subtle colors and subtle tones without blowing them out of the park, because then it just looks fake and ridiculous and gaudy. And even though the pheasant, as I said before, is a gaudy, ridiculous bird in a lot of ways, there's a lot of subtlety there too, which is, you know, a paradox. But <clears throat> And so I'm thinking about as that on his side of his chest, there's kind of a kind of that brighter yellow color. But as it kind of rounds underneath and goes into shadow, 
it goes really neutral. It doesn't just get darker, but it gets more neutral. And so you know, have to you have to think about that in addition to the feather pattern itself, how those feathers read as a whole. And it would be kind of easier if I was going to spend the next two weeks painting this bird and took that much time to really analyze and delineate every single feather and get the value and the color right. I'm just not interested in painting that way. That to me is just a, not a good use of my time. In the end, if I can get this bird to read in a way that's completely effective, but I can do it in a, in a simple way that doesn't take the rest of my life, that is so much more worthwhile. Now again, I'm not trying to be lazy. I'm not trying to look for the shortcut and produce something that's not of high quality. It's just, is it gonna be, is it gonna be more effective if I render this thing for the next three weeks? I would say no, not if I do it right. You know, and so if I can get away with, again, painting it simply and directly, Number one, yeah, I'm not spending the rest of my life painting this one bird, which would bore me to death and drive me crazy. And number two, I think it's more interesting. I think if, if, if you can look at it and see a brush stroke, that's such a more interesting way to paint it than rendering every feather out to intricate detail. And, and different painters would disagree with me on that. That's fine. I just don't want to spend the next three weeks painting this bird. I really don't. <laughs> you can call me lazy if you want. I want to move on to something else. I want to paint other things or have more fun with that background. So again, these are the things that just go through your mind as, a, as an artist, as a painter. How much do I really want to invest in this? Would it be more effective if I did spend the next three weeks painting this bird? So I want to draw it correctly. I want the shapes and those feathers to be correct in every way. But I want them to be simple. And maybe even a little bit rough. And maybe even celebrate, celebrate the fact that this is paint on canvas. That's a cool thing. There's nothing wrong with it being a painting. I'm celebrating that. <clears throat> Richard Schmidt said that the definition of Impressionism is up close, nothing, but from a distance, everything. I think that pretty much sums it up. I want people to look at this and say, oh, it's a beautiful pheasant. I love the iridescence of his you know, breast feathers and that purple and that orange and how everything works. And then get up close and it's like, oh, it's just kind of it's just paint, and it's maybe even a little rough in some spots. I would take that as a compliment, to make rough paint read as a beautiful bird. That's not easy. So here I'm going back in with those orange tones, and again, that whole push-pull idea put the darks down, now I'm going back over with the lights, and then I'm going to go back over with the darks maybe, just back and forth. And um, kind of trying to find a highlight on top of that tail. Oh, I'm going back into the corn. I went back in with some light grays in the corn to try to get some detail, and I, <clears throat> I came back later and painted back over them because they were a little bit overdone. And the corn itself was had kind of lost its substance. It was just kind of light and flat and cool. <clears throat> and it I wanted it to be more warm and mid-tone. So you know, I think I kind of venture off screen here a little bit. I apologize for that. I was going back in and putting some lights in 
Uh, but just so you know, a lot of these didn't survive to the final finished painting because they just were a little much. But as you see that, you can see the corn getting a little more delineated. It's kind of getting some depth now. Um, which is a good thing. But I think especially at this stage, it's, it's really easy to mess stuff up. So I'm really trying to paint with caution now. And even this painting was a learning experience about how easily things can be taken too far. I had to go back in and tone things back down in the end. Because uh, you don't want to over, over fuss with stuff. It loses its effectiveness when you do that. So I'm going back in and bringing up his leg color a little bit. It wasn't, the pheasant's legs aren't black like I had them. They're more of a, a mid-tone gray. So I was getting that. And now I'd kind of been waiting for this for a long time. I wanted to go back in with the brightest value in the snow and, and delineate the snow horizon against that corn, make that a sharp edge. And what that does is it really gives the piece depth. <clears throat> so you can see that sharp edge up against the base of the corn. It's just, the, and I've been waiting to do this to kind of cut off the ragged parts at the bottom of the corn and make that snow line sharp. <clears throat> that really adds depth. And you see I do that in the um, the far line of corn and then also in these, this few closer stalks. <clears throat> and the principle is the same. It's just making that edge sharp. Um, just pushes that corn back. And you see I add a little bit of you know, snow where it would be the next row over. It's slightly in shadow. It's a little darker value. But again, it just pushes that corn, separates it out, and gives it depth <clears throat> by cutting that off and making the edge sharp. <clears throat> and now I'm just roughing it over, bringing it up to a final white value and giving it that kind of rougher texture that would match the sky and the corn, which I like. So basically, I'm almost done here. Um, here's a picture of the final piece. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it. And uh, like and subscribe. 